What? <laughs> yes, uh, Jacopo has uh, an announcement. There was a question. Um, so the bus will uh, start at um, three, it's okay. Actually, it can be flexible. So if you <coughs> want to stay a little bit more, not before, not, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so, it, so, okay, so at, at three, the bus will leave and, uh, and, and left you to the hotel. 3 p.m. There is lunch, not works in the afternoon. I don't know because I have always uh, different uh, different information. <coughs> I can overrule this, but uh, okay. I, I they told me now that in principle can be up to three. Uh, you uh, no, this not no. This is don't don't ask me why, but uh, this is not possible. <laughs> <laughs> I think I thought maybe if you want to discuss, you can do it, uh, and it's not it would be useful. Or otherwise, if you want to go to the hotel and uh, take a break, we can also. No, no. Uh, the guy, Rodrigo, told me that he will be here. I'm not unsure of anything, but this is what they told me. <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to the hotel, fine. <laughs> At two, two, two. Today there is, final day. And then there is the dinner at seven, again, uh, at this hotel, Friar Mar. Uh, yes, so nice organizing, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. uh, all right, so first talk is uh, Gabor Takash. Uh, so so uh, it's very nice to be back here uh, in Natal. And thanks, for the, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me and giving the opportunity to present my work. So. This is a work about entanglement growth and how it is related to the quasi-particle spectrum. So it's going to follow actually three papers of which actually these two will be the most, uh, the new part. But I will go quickly over the first one as well because it's an outgrowth of the first one and maybe it's just nice. I like that paper, so I, li I like to talk about it whenever I can. And these are my collaborators. Sorry, Mario. Actually, that's, that's, that's the only picture I found about you. So <laughs> it's always everywhere. It's on the Facebook and everywhere. So I, like, I actually like it. I think, <laughs> I think it's fitting that <laughs> it appears here. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> so copyright Spiros. Mario is copyright Spiros. <laughs> OK, so here are my collaborators, Pascale Calabrese, Mario Colura sitting up there, Martin Kormos, who unfortunately couldn't come who is in my group, and these are actually two young graduate students who, with whom I did the third work together. Okay. Right, so that's the outline. So I'm going to give a very quick introduction because everybody knows this, but it's included anyway. So the quasi-particle description of relaxation in quantum quenches, and something about light cone spreading of correlations, again, just a quick introduction. And then I'm going to describe the confinement and suppression of light cone dynamics in the ferromagnetic phase of the, of the spin chains. And in the paramagnetic phase, I'm going to talk about what the new stuff, or relatively new stuff, is this enhancement of entanglement generation and its relation to what is called the Gibbs paradox, which I realize that uh, many people just don't know what it is. It's a really classical physical paradox. So any, anybody who still doesn't know what it is? OK, I will tell you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and then I uh, go to the conclusions. So as we all know, quantum quench is a paradigmatic non-equilibrium protocol. So we just suppose that this initial state is a ground state of some local Hamiltonian. Uh, at least that's what I mean by a quantum. Okay, there can be different notions of that, but this is, uh, for me, this is the standard notion. 
And the quantum quench is a sudden change in the Hamiltonian to some new one with which we do the time evolution. And I'm considering global quantum quenches, which means that both Hamiltonians are translational and invariant, which means that uh, the expectation value post quench is extensive. It's proportional to the volume of the system. So the initial state is thermodynamical, as we all know, finite energy density. And so the picture how the system relaxes or what it does after quench. Okay, not, uh, sorry, that's not, that's, that's not right. <laughs> Next one will be about the picture. But basically, that, that, that just a quick recap that there is some relaxation thermization happening. So classical closed system, we know it's, it's by Boltzmann's H theorem. In closed quantum anybody system, we all know that the basic questions are whether they actually approach any steady state, what is the nature of the steady state, and how does this relaxation happen. So this, uh, and this is the paradigmatic experiment. So this is the thing that I'm going to consider the third uh, problem here. How does the relaxation happen to, uh, to the steady state proceed? So this is the picture, how, how it happens, at least a picture of how it would happen. So the idea is that we have a finite energy density, and that means that from that finite energy density, we are creating pairs of quasi-particles. Let me suppose that the system supports quasi-particles. So I, that's already an assumption. It's already an assumption that this picture is valid. Okay, I'm going to comment on it. So, but uh, after the quench, we have an extensive energy, so that acts as a source of quasi-particles, uh, which are created in pairs. I suppose that these pairs are independent, which is actually an assumption which is either exactly valid for some quenches, which are called integrable quenches, or it's approximately valid. In my case, it is going to be approximately valid in most cases, which I'm going to actually check. And uh, so we have some, these have some momentum dependent velocities and they entangle the system as they propagate. But because there is an upper limit in most systems, in many systems, there's an upper limit on the velocity, the Lee Robbins on bound, the entanglement propagation and the correlations propagate via so-called light, cone, uh, light cones. So it's like a relativistic spreading of information uh, by some maximum speed, except that this is not the speed of light, but it's this Lee Robinson velocity, which is uh, uh, system dependent. Right, and there have been lots of uh, papers and works in which people saw this uh, light cone spreading. I'm, I'm not even commenting which is which. I mean, the light cone is quite obvious, especially in these three pictures there, so it's quite obviously there <laughs> and even uh, like so this is this looks like a universal feature of post quench time evolution that's one of the things that we think is quite universal in the post quench time evolution having this sort of light cone picture at least if, if there is local interaction so I'm always assuming local interaction I'm not assuming uh, some sort of long-range interaction and even in experiment there is but there is nice experiment in some quench atomic motor insulator the light cone is drawn by that line there. So you see the spreading of the correlations according to some finite velocity. So that's very nice. And if you look at some integrable models, then you can even compute this exactly. So in the transfer fieldizing model, actually Pascal and uh, John Carty computed this exactly. That's an integrable model. So we can actually uh, take this picture and do the computation, and we get what we expect. So there's a linear growth of, of entanglement, right? Uh, entanglement of a finite interval always saturates to some value because there's a, because there's a maximum value in the interval that, that the interval can support. But up until, up until the saturation happens, there's a linear growth. And also, this also shows the correlations just falling up exponentially outside the light cone. So this is a correlation at a certain time, and we see that the correlation also falls off. Right, so this is the standard picture. So it's, it, it's, it, it's quite, uh, so to say, quite uh, surprising to find something that doesn't fit in the standard picture. So this is what happened with us. So we took this non-integrable extension of the Ising spin chain, where we also had the, this HX, which is the longitudinal field. We know that this system is no longer integrable. So we actually, what we tried to do, we didn't try to do anything with the light cone. But we wanted to understand what happens when the integrality is broken. And originally, actually, we tried to do this using a field theoretic approach. So we actually considered the scaling field theory. And that's, that's actually the paper in 2016 where we, where we first considered this. And we wanted to see something like this picture where 
if we have the integrable time evolution, then we have the blue curve. There is some relaxation to some integrable steady state, whatever, whatever its nature, that, that's, that, that's what we assume. If we give some small integrability breaking, what you expect, system will relax to some thermal state. Uh, it's a non-integrable time evolution. But as you see in the middle, it, because it's small integrability breaking, at intermediate times it can get trapped in some quasi-integrable metastable state, which is called pre-thermalization. And actually, this is what we wanted to see. Okay, so we just made this model in order to see whether we can actually get this pre-thermalization in field theory. So that's so that's what we wanted to see whether it's there. But also, I mean, this is this was quite at at, at that time it was already expected that this should be quite universal, so we didn't expect anything. Actually, this was this started off as a student project for my student Tibor Rakowski, who is the first author. So it wasn't something that we expected to be very complicated. Probably we just simulated time evolution. We see a nice uh, pre-thermalization, maybe, may, maybe find out something interesting about it and write a short paper. So what happened? The system didn't want to relax, okay? So actually, uh, this, uh, this was in the ferromagnetic phase when age that is less than one. Now I'm using the spin chain language. There we use the field theory language, but there's an appropriate correspondence between all, all, all these pictures. And so what happened when Mario, okay, we had a trouble here. So actually we went to Mario. Mario ha had this nice ITBD program. So we asked Mario to simulate this uh, on the lattice. <laughs> and then obviously when you do ITBD, this uh, standard matrix product state method, because you are following the method in uh, its, its entanglement entropy regulated method. So you always compute entanglement entropy as a function of time. So what happened basically is that if hx was zero in a quench, we were quenching in hz in transverse field. When hx was zero, we had this very nice linear growth. And then as soon as we switched on even a very small hx, it was truncated. And this truncation, I'm telling you, this, is, this has nothing to do with the finite size truncation. This is actually half space entanglement. So it's completely unbounded. And this ITBD is an infinite volume method. So as long as the bond dimension is not reached, this, this, this should actually grow. And because it can grow that much as, as, as is indicated there, you know that the bond dimension is, would be big enough for this to grow further. So this plateau here is, uh, was, was, a, was a mystery. What happens there uh, was something that we didn't expect, okay? So, and actually, when you look at correlators, then, then, then it started to dawn upon us what, 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 what was happening. So when we had no longitudinal field, we just had a very nice light cone picture. Light, a slight light cone spreading off the, of the, this is actually longitudinal magnetization. It's the same in the transverse, so it's just a longitudinal plot. And what happened as we switched on just a very small longitudinal field, the light cone got suppressed, it got truncated, and instead of correlation spreading with a linear boundary, what happened is that this boundary had this oscillatory shape. It's actually Pascal later wrote a nice popular text when he was talking about cone or flask, the shape that detects whatever is to come. Okay? So this shape detects some physics, this shape change of the, of, of, of this of the support of the correlation detects some physics, and at this point, we were actually in good place because, because we were in investigating this physics just completely independently in another project just a few months before. So the light cone gets suppressed, and the physics is actually confinement. So this is an old story, goes back to McCoy and Wu 78. So actually, when you have no longitudinal field, this theory is actually just a theory of free fermions with a well-known dispersion relation. It's actually just a three Majorana fermions. It's a lattice, uh, uh, the dispersion relation is just the lattice dispersion for a three Majorana fermion. So if you take age that less than one, that these massive fermions are domain walls which separate different domains of, uh, uh, domains of different magnetization, okay, because there's spontaneous symmetry breaking. So even the magnetization is, is, is exactly known. And what happens is, uh, this, is this is what they, uh, that's a, it's a uh, sort of like simplified picture how they look like because it's not sharp. I mean, actually, actually there's some quantumness in this picture. That's not a, it's, it's not a classical configuration, except that uh, age that's strictly zero. But what happens is that uh, if you switch on HX, one of the vacua is unfavored. So then, so then you get a, a split between the two vacua. 
and basically the energy uh, that you get, the additional energy, just proportional to the volume that vacuum occupies. So, for example, you imagine a domain wall and an anti-domain wall, and if you get this configuration, and this is the unfavored vacuum, then you get an additional energy which is just proportional to this distance, which means that these two domain walls attract each other with the linear potential, and then, I mean, this is, this, this is what confinement is. So there are no free domain walls. They, they cannot go away because the uh, potential energy will grow without bound, but they are always just confined. They are confined into, into, what, into what we call mesons, simply, actually, McCoy and who I think already call them mesons, simply by analogy to QCD, because this is also what happens in strong interactions with quarks. The quark is basically the domain wall here, and this bound state is basically what is called a meson in the strong interactions. Yes. Oh, oh, the initial state. The initial state was extremely simple. Actually, it doesn't depend much on that. But the initial state was simply all spins up. It's, we, we just wanted to do something simple that could, we, we, even with an eye with a, on experiments, I mean, if you imagine that you can do an Ising chain in an experiment, probably that's a state that you can always do. You just put a big magnetization, and then you turn it off, and then it starts from a state which is all polarized up. So uh, yeah, that's uh, actually, that, that, that's a good question, which we, uh, I, OK. Maybe we can return to that. There, there, there could be some initial states from which you don't get that. Uh, so, for example, one, one thing that bugger, uh, buggers me, uh, about, bugs me about all this, that whether you can actually see the deconfinement phase transition, like, like in QCD, whether you can start with high energy density in the initial state such that you actually see and you can vary it, see the deconfinement. I, 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 couldn't, get, uh, I couldn't get it done yet. But, um, Okay, so in, so in strong interactions, this is actually what happens. Instead of, in contrast to electric, ele electricity, the chromoelectric field lines of the QCD are actually attracted to each other. That's the picture. They are attracted by these gluons, and they form strings. And basically, the energy invested in this line is proportional to its length. So you get a linear potential. This is the standard picture of what happens in strong interactions. So the flux density is constant along the string simply because all the flux is just going parallel from one charge to another and this density is constant if you take any cross section of the string. So the field, so the field strength is constant, the force is constant, inter interaction grows linearly with distance. And basically that's why quarks are confined, that's the usual picture of string breaking. If you try to pull them apart, then you just, inv you just invest enough energy so that the quark pair can quark anti quark pair can form and the string snaps and you never get quarks out of the system. Right. So actually, the Ising model is not a very good, uh, not, 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 uh, not an ideal analogy, because there are only two colors, and two colors mean only mesons. Actually, QCD has three colors, which means that it also has states called baryons, like the proton and the neutron. But the POTS model, the free state POTS model, is a good generalization where you have three colors, I mean, for the spin. And that, that's, that's exactly it. We already know that the spectrum of the POTS model does support baryons. So uh, one, one of the things that I would still like to do is to get this picture working in the POTS model, which I have, I have computed a lot of things, but I still haven't got a completely coherent picture of what happens. That the baryons over, uh, complicate the dynamics a lot, okay? So, but I see confinement there as well, and confinement can be partial or total. It's, 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 much, it's uh, even more colorful picture than, really colorful, three colors, okay? More colorful picture than in the Ising model. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all chains, yes. It's all, all just spin chains, yes, quantum spin chains. Right, so what is the effect of confinement on time evolution? So what, uh, what happens if the post-quench Hamilton is confining? So what you have is you start from the same picture as Cardi and Calabrese, okay? So you have the initial state that acts as a source of quasi-particles. The pairs of quasi-particles are created, start, start out. Then when they move away, then they start feeling this attraction, okay? The attractive interaction. So the interaction eventually pulls them back because it grows without bound if, if the distance is increasing. At some point, it just overcomes the kinetic energy. And then this is what happens. So this is actually Mario's, Mario's very nice drawing here, which was, uh, which was the cover drawing of the paper. So that this is, at first, when the, when the domain walls are created after the quench, uh, they just don't feel this attractive force because they are too close to each other, so they start going away along the light cone. But at some point, you can imagine this. It's not really a spring because the, 
because the force law is not like that of a spring, but uh, it's linear potential, not quadratic, but uh, we drew a spring, so then it just turns them away, and then it starts oscillating. And this oscillation frequency is actually, it's, it's encoded in the system, in the physics of the system. So uh, that is actually how you can confirm that this is the right picture. Because otherwise, I mean, this is just like a story I told you, with no support, <laughs> practically just some guesses, okay? And, and, and how you actually confirm that, uh, that the dynamics has to do something with this uh, confinement of quasi-particles, actually you need real signatures. You need some physical signature to show that these quasi-particles are really the, uh, these confined quasi-particles, the mesons are really responsible. The confinement is really responsible for all the dynamics that you see. So first thing is that you want to know what these mesons are. So I'm just flashing this really, it's just um, a paper by a uh, Belarusian physicist uh, Rutkevich from 2008. Just consider the two fermions in one dimension on this chain with this Hamiltonian. I mean really on the chain, so it was really discretized uh, lattice uh, system. And he just wrote down the Hamiltonian, there is the dispersion relation of the Ising model and then there is this potential, the linear potential, uh, you go into the center of momentum frame and then you basically quantize this Hamiltonian semi-classically. You use Bohr's on Merfeld quantization, but you go to momentum space. So you actually take the Fourier transform of this. So it's, it's, it's a little tricky. You take the Fourier transform of this Hamiltonian and use Bohr's on Merfeld quantization in momentum space, not in coordinate space. Uh, and so actually what happens is that the kinetic energy, the potential energy becomes the kinetic energy and the other one becomes the potential in momentum space. And that actually leads to some interesting uh, issues. So number of energies of mesons, they depend on the, on, 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 on the, on the parameters. They also depend actually on the center of, uh, center of mass momentum. Fortunately for us, in the quench, the center of mass momentum is zero because of momentum conservation. At least these states dominate, so that's not really a problem, so we actually have only two parameters, and then there are this potential, this artificial potential made by this uh, kinetic energy can have a shape with either one or two minima, and you have to solve the Borsum effort quantization separately for, e for each of these cases. It's, uh, uh, and and you, you, you just get these equations for the eigenstates, uh, for, the, for, for, the, for this momentum parameterizing the eigenstates, which you have to solve for this Ka, and once you have it, then you, uh, th then, you, then you plug it into the formula for omega, and then you get the energy of the state. Okay, so you have a prediction for what the spectrum should be. It's actually a semi-classical prediction, so it's a Bohr's on Merfeld, but it's better than nothing. And then what you do is that you take the time evolution of magnetization that has these ripples that you, that you also see on the boundary of the light cone, right? This sort of oscillations. And you get, you get this picture. You get the same in field theory, by the way. This is where the, all, the, all it started. We get the same pictures in field theory and we didn't understand why it wasn't relaxing. What you see are persistent oscillations in time. You observe no relaxation. You can go to very, very long times. You just don't see anything. And and the question was, how could this happen? And the system is non-integrable. What's, what, what's, what's happening here? So this is what I'm showing here. These are actually data from already from the spin chain. And uh, to check, cross-check the ITBD, we also did uh, exact diagonalization with system sizes 8, 10, and 12. And they are indistinguishable, basically, from the ITBD for a certain reason that I'm going to comment on. So it's uh, like ED actually is very good. You don't actually have... Uh, I mean, we didn't know it in advance, but you don't actually need this very fancy machinery of ITBD to get the... It's very nice that you have it, but ED already gives you the right picture. Exact diagonalization. And so you have these oscillations. You just take the power spectrum of the time evolution. You simply take this time series, take the Fourier transform, take the power spectrum. And what you see are extremely clear peaks. It's not, it's not a continuum. The extremely clear, well-localized peaks. And this is, this, this is what tells you that there's a quasi-particle picture underlying these dynamics, because these peaks are the quasi-particle peaks. If you look at their positions, except the first one, which, is, which corresponds to a difference between uh, the frequencies. In quenches, you have differences of uh, energy levels, so you also have difference frequency. These peaks are exactly at the locations predicted by the semi-classical uh, approach. Actually, the resolution with, with which we can get the peaks from the Fourier transform is, is, is such that you shouldn't actually attribute anything to this difference there because it's, uh, 
we just don't have the resolution to say that this peak is not a little, uh, little away and, and, and is not exactly sitting. Probably not exactly sitting on it because it's not exactly semi-classical, but uh, anyway, so this, there, are, there are these three cases with the appropriate numbers you can, you, you, can, you can read and the lines are drawn at the numbers and the peaks are really there. So what's happening here is actually that the system is non-integrable. So uh, one, one thing that would support the Cardi Calabrese picture is out of the question because in integrable systems you do expect it once you create the particles because of the elastic scattering of integrability you expect to be able to keep the, uh, this sort of quasi-particle picture in time. Uh, it's also quite non-perturbative. This is a very non-perturbative thing that's happening. What turns out, if you look at very carefully at the density, at the particle density, if you just uh, evaluate it numerically, I did it from ED just for fun, it turns out that the average separation between these quasi-particles is much longer than, than the correlation lengths which you can estimate. So actually this is a very, this is not a dense system. The density, quasi-particle density is very small post quench even, even though it's very non-perturbative. Yes? Oh, it's not, it's, it's, it, it depends, it depends on the observable, for example, because, because, because there are selection rules and all that, and I mean, all of these, these are form factors, basically, these are operator form, the, the, I mean, the height, okay, there is the overlap, but the height, uh, because this is an operatic element, it also has the operator form factor. These form factors are some quite complicated functions which depend on the, on the actual parameters of the model, so sometimes they are just missing for no particular reason, it's just the form factor is too small to resolve the peak. I mean, in, in field theory, I, I, I've seen this. So it's just the height of the peaks is not so, not, uh, doesn't have so much information. N uh, or not necessarily, at least, okay? I think, let me see the difference between these two pictures is, is that we are starting from a different, so this is, this is, this is an overlap difference. So we are starting, in this case, the post quench system is the same, but we are starting from a different uh, pre quench magnetization, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. That's the difference between left and right picture. So this is, this is clearly an overlap difference. That's, the, that overlap is simply too small. Okay, actually, actually, I think we sort of, yeah, you see these overlaps are extremely small compared to that one. Yeah, 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 it, it could be there. It, it, it could be just below resolution, okay? You, 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 you can't really say, but, but you see that these numbers are, the individual one particle overlaps are already quite small compared to this, and this is the product of such things. So it's, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not obvious that you should see anything there. Yes? Hmm? Well, you have, you have lots of mesons here. What, uh, what's happening is somehow they are, they are, they are spaced out uh, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, sparse. So if you take a box of a correlation length, which is basically somehow the, uh, the unit, unit, unit cell in which actual dynamics is happening, say five correlation length, then there is just a single meson, either a single meson or zero that fits in. So you have infinitely many mesons in this system, but somehow you just get one meson. If you take a higher, dense, higher energy, what I expect is that you would reach the confinement transition. I haven't been able to simulate that. I tried, okay? I haven't been able to do it yet, but maybe I was just doing something wrong. So y what, what you expect, that, that, that you would be able to, to, to open this light cone by just simply getting in what is in QCD, the confinement phase transition, if the density is, is big enough. I'm not sure that's enough. I, I, I don't have a clear picture of what, what, what is a density that's enough for the confinement, but, but, but surely the first thing is that the mesons should overlap. And then how much they should overlap before they deconfine, I, I don't really know, okay? So I, I don't know what is the density of, about which this happens. It's a, it's a good, nice question, okay? Something that keeps me awake sometimes. Uh, to, to how can I do this, actually? So how can I see the deconfinement phase transition? Because it must be there somewhere. Or it could be a crossover like in, like in QCD. I'm not, I'm not committed to an actual phase transition. Okay, so this is the summary of this dynamical confinement. So in the Ising chain, we have this confinement. It changes the light cone spreading of correlations and entanglement. And the pre-thermalization is also absent. The system is trapped in some persistent oscillations. There's not even a pre-thermalization, not even a metastable pre-thermalization. It's long time. Uh, the system is oscillating. 
So the questions that I still have uh, had at least at that time, some of them are partially answered already, which I showed there, was that is it a general property or just, or just Ising model? So it turns out that in the massive Schwinger model, this was, this was seen. The massive Schwinger model is another model which, uh, which shows uh, uh, confinement. Actually, they map the massive Schwinger model is a, is, a, is a field theory, but they simulated it with the matrix product method after discretization. So it's, it's, it's very similar to this, but it has a gauge field and things, so it's a more complicated thing. Long range spin chains, interesting long range interactions can, can induce confinement. Then, is something that is still missing to me is to find, to see some nice experiment in which you see the truncated light cone, because this is quite robust. This seems quite robust, but somehow to realize a system in experiment, or maybe there is some that I just, did, I just didn't catch it. Okay, so if anybody's seen such experiment, just tell me, because I would love to see that. And whether this is true in higher dimensions, for example, in QCD, so all the dynamics in QCD is there. Uh, you could try to do holography. Actually, there's a paper about holographic quenches which, uh, which was sort of uh, seeing at least ingredients. Lattice simulations could maybe try to, try to see this in QCD. So actually, maybe thermalization is not so simple in QCD as well. So confinement may actually affect thermalization there as well. I'm not sure what, what, what would be the actual results. I mean, thermalization is important, for example, with heavy ion collisions, right? Everybody supports thermalizations of these systems when collision happens after. So it's a question whether they actually thermalize. Nobody actually knows whether this happens or not. And the, the other thing is that, uh, Robert, are you going to talk about this or something else? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so let, me just, let me just introduce Robert's talk. <laughs> so that basically these mesons are sort of rare states. They form a sequence of states which, which goes very deeply at high energy. Actually, it's a question of what happens at the middle of the spectrum, famous middle of the spectrum with them, but it's not obvious that, uh, uh, the answer to me, not, not obvious, but these states violate ETH, and they are also seen in field theory, so I think Robert is going to, to tell you about that. So I'm not telling uh, more, just, this is just a teaser for Robert's talk. So, okay, so that was sort of an extended introduction. And then the thing is that what you do, Ferromagnetic phase, you found this confinement, you're very happy, but obviously you have a chain, it has a paramagnetic phase. Okay, then the paramagnetic phase, there's no confinement, so you just do your ITBD calculations, very nice pictures by Mario. You see a nice light cone. The light cone speed is changing, but that's what you expect because if you introduce a new interaction, the dispersion relation would be changing, the Lee Robinson velocity would be changing, so the Dotted line is the original light cone speed at hx equals zero. And if you increase hx, actually it goes down. That will be important later. Okay, so if you increase, if you switch on this longitudinal field and you increase it, then this, this light cone velocity goes down. Okay, and you can also, right, what's, what's this? There is something wrong with this. With, 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 okay, I don't, I don't see what I've done there. Uh, some, okay, something got messed up, this, okay. So this should be all paramagnetic. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm saying, what, what I did here. Probably, probably at night I exchanged some of the pictures and something got, got, got wrong with it, okay. Anyway, so, <laughs> but, the, but, 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 but the real point, the real point is this, is this picture here, okay? So the real, the, uh, the real point is that you do this, quench in the paramagnetic phase. There is this linear growth of entanglement when you don't have HX. You switch on HX, you still have a linear growth, but there are some entropy oscillations, but we know about these. These are always there. There's some background growth of uh, linear growth, and then on top of this sit, could sit some entropy oscillations. So what happens is that you are increasing your integrability breaking parameter. And at some point, the entropy starts growing like crazy. So if you look, if you increase the uh, integrability breaking at first, it, it's even the entropy generation velocity, so to say, the entropy generation rate is going down because this is without integrability breaking, it's below that. But you seem to cross some threshold and then it suddenly turns up. So that's the question there. What, 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 what is that? So this is what we then set out to investigate. So there's an anomalous entropy growth in paramagnetic quenches, and actually Rodrik Mosner uh, 
suggested that we should get a cleaner case because in this case, when in, in this normal, normal in these trenches that we considered in the uh, in the in the uh, in the confinement paper, we always varied two parameters. We started from some HZ and zero HX, and we switched to some different HZ and and, and non-zero HX. But varying two parameters is something which is not clean. You don't you never know which parameter does the job that 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 you see on the graphs. So what we did is that we simply kept the transverse field constant in the paramagnetic phase. Another error. HZ is larger than one in paramagnetic phase. Wow. Okay. Good. And what, and, 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 and what, and what we did, we just, we just switched on longitudinal field. Okay. That, that was the only, that was the quench. We just switched on this longitudinal field. That's the quench. And this is what you get. So this is, uh, this is basically how the entropy grows in different quenches, different, uh, with different parameters up, up there. You see these nice oscillations. And at late times, you can fit it with this. Uh, uh, the average entropy growth can be fit by a linear uh, uh, behavior. And then you extract, you extract the steepness of this linear behavior. Okay? And then you plot it as the function of the quench size of this new field that you switched on, this HX that you switched on. And this is what you see. At first, it's quite small. Then there's a minimum somewhere, even. And then after that minimum, there's, a, there, there's an upturn, very sharp upturn. Actually, it's sh uh, the closer you are in the, at the critical point, the sharper the upturn is. Okay? And, then, and, and then entropy starts being generated like crazy in the system. And so these are, these, these are the this is the feature that, that is uh, being encircled there. So this is, this is what you see. Okay, so now what's happening, there are several ways to, to look at this. So we use quench spectroscopy. The idea is exactly the same as before. We just look at the magnetization and we try to extract, we try to extract the Fourier spectrum of, of frequencies which are, uh, which are in the time series. And what you see if you increase the quench size, there are different observables that you have to consider. Okay? If you increase the quench size, so here's the quasi-particle peak. There is just a, in principle, when you start, there is just a single quasi-particle in the system, okay? What happens if you increase HX in the post quench system, there appears a new peak in the spectrum. So there's a new quasi-particle. And so the idea that, uh, that, uh, that, that came to mind then is that, uh, is that if a new quasi-particle appears in the spectrum, what happens is that you are generating these pairs. Okay, these pairs are carrying some entanglement information, but now they are also carrying the information of what they are composed of, because they can compose of either, let's call, them, let's call the particles one and two. They can be either one, 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 two, or two, two pairs. So there's a which particle information which is being carried. There's a mixing entropy, which is just, which is just somehow associated to which particle is of which species. So, in, so these pairs are expected to carry much larger entropy than with a single quasi-particle species. And the question is actually whether you can really attribute that peak or, or that upturn to, this, uh, to the appearance of this new quasi-particle. So what, what we did was uh, looking at the spectrum by exact diagonalization. In the exact diagonalization spectrum, we just determined uh, the critical value for this parameter HX at which the new quasi-particle appears in the post quench system. And then these are the critical values that you see here. And funnily, they sit exactly where the minimum is. So actually, they sit exactly where the trend is overturned. There is a decreasing trend before this, and that, that's exactly the point where the trend is overturned and, and it starts increasing, except that for large enough HZ, you do notice some delay. And so that I'm going to explain that as well. So that actually the quasi-particle appears a little er uh, earlier than the change in the trend. Not much, just a little earlier. So these are actually the thresholds that are plotted there. And those are, those are the arrows pointing out the thresholds. And this is the delay. Okay. So there is some delay. And that's, so that, 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 that's, that, that's also interesting what, what it corresponds to. So now this is the Gibbs paradox, okay? the equilibrium Gibbs paradox, finally. So the paradox is very simple. It goes back to 19th century. And 
conserves the extensivity of entropy, basically. So the idea is that you have uh, two boxes of gas, and then you take out the wall. And classically, if the two gases are different, then you expect that there is a contribution to the entropy. Um, okay, you can just compute how much the entropy changes, okay? That, that's the easy way. If the two are different, then the entropy is changing by, by, uh, by a finite amount. Actually, it, it is proportional to the number of particles. And you can simply add to it's n log 2 is very simple. 2 is the number of states the particles can, can, can be in, blue or, blue or purple. Okay? And basically, every, every particle is a bit. And then you have n log 2 additional information just to switch particle information. Okay? And this is, comp this, this is irreversible. If you put back the wall on the right hand side, you never get back here. But if the two particles are of the same species, then you compute the entropy. Uh, you compute the entropy change, it's actually zero. It actually results to be zero if you use the standard entropy formula for ideal gas. And it's very easy to see why this is reversible. You put back the wall in the middle, you get back exactly to the left feature. But there is a, there is a mystery here, I think, which is the real... Uh, the paradox is phrased in many ways, but the, li uh, the way I like to phrase it is that what does distinguishability play? You know, uh, what is the role that distinguishability plays in all this? This is a classical system. And also, how distinguishable they should be. I mean, if it's ortho and parahydrogen, is it distinguishable or not? It's just nuclear moment, nuclear moment, right? Or what, what, what is the label under which they should be distinguishable? If they are very, very sm similar to each other now, I mean, this is an on-off feature, you see. There is no small parameter here. Either it is there or not. There is nothing to tune. So this is, for me, this is the, this is the real problem of the paradox. It's not, it's not really extensivity of the entropy because that you can cure by just putting one over n factorial in the appropriate place, places of the classical calculations as we learn in statistical mechanics. But the real, the, the real essence of the paradox is what does it mean to be distinguishable? Especially in a system when you, your particles are quasi-particles, they actually have finite lifetimes in the system. They have finite widths, okay? So it's not something like uh, being a particle is something that is determined by God or some, or, or, or some higher, 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 whatever, for, for once, once, once and for all, okay? So what, 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 what does it mean to be distinguishable? Right. So now we... Uh, First, first, before I talk about distinguishability, I just want to argue that the effect of mixing entropy potentially explains, I don't say we have a full theory, that's actually one of the open questions, but it really potentially explains what we see there. Okay, so there is this nice paper by Pascale, which came out uh, during which we, we were investigating that, and uh, it, just tells, it, it just contains a method by which you can actually make a semi-classical calculation of entropy generated, supposing that there are also mixed pairs. So let me suppose that the state I'm creating contains two species and they are pairs of the same species but they are also mixing terms. So this is the general post quench state. It is just like a coherent state or, no, sorry, li like a Bogolyubov-like -like st state but it also contains uh, different species, okay? So now what you do, you, wa you want to, you want to co evaluate the entanglement of the left between the left and the right movers. This is the entanglement that is propagating throughout the system. This is how the system gets entangled. That left mover goes this way, right mover goes that way, but they are entangled. This is how the system gets correlated. So what you do first, you just take the density matrix corresponding to the state. You trace out, say, left movers. You get a reduced density matrix, and then you, then you compute the entropy. Mode, actually mode by mode. You can compute it mode by mode in this simple picture. And then the entropy growth rate in infinite volume is, is, is simply given by the entropy carried by each mode and the velocity. That's actually a tricky question. We'll, we'll come to that. And actual velocity of each uh, mode. But let me simplify a little that there is some well-defined velocity. Okay. So fortunately, we, also, we were also doing some other calculations. And we actually don't know. We actually don't know these magnitudes of pair creation amplitudes. Okay, we don't know the actual amplitudes by which the pairs are created in the spin chain. But we could, com we, we could just simulate this, uh, the, uh, the continuum limit of this chain in a separate work, and actually we got, some, we got some amplitudes out, and just phenomenologically, I choose the, we chose the relations 
uh, we chose the relations that we observed in the, in the field theory to be valid on the spin chain, saying at least if I'm close to the continuum limit, probably the amplitudes are related in the same way. And what, what we do is that we increase Hx plus the threshold Hx2, where the new particle appears. When it appears, it starts to be generated. So this amplitude B, which corresponds to the amplitude of B pairs, starts to appear, starts to increase from zero to something. This is the simple thing that I consider. And then this is what happens. So if you compute this mixing, uh, this entanglement entropy that is propagating through the system, if you have no mixing, it's much lower than, with, than, 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 than if there is mixing. The no mixing would just correspond to the standard picture when you don't have the rich particle information. So compared to that, there's a huge jump in the entropy generation potential of the system, right? If there is mixing. So this is actually the rich particle information that differentiates between the two, or you can just take the ratio of the two curves and actually you see if the, if the new, this is just parameterizing how much of the new particle appear, appears after the quench. And you see that there's a, actually, if you look, if you look at the ratio, it's, 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 it's even more obvious that there's a quite big jump at first, at least. Then it goes down, that's another effect. <laughs> Maybe I won't have time to, uh, to, to tell you what it is, but if yes, then I will comment on that. So why does the entropy generation goes down, go down if uh, Hx goes to infinity? Okay, so why the delayed onset? Why does it happen that if the particle appears at these values of Hx, at least if Hz is large enough, you see that this minimum and that minimum is not exactly at the point where the threshold is. So there are actually three reasons. And two of them are actually probably connected. The first one, the first one isn't. The first thing is that if you see it, if you see that before actually, before actually uh, this increase sets in, there was already a decrease. So now you, now you inject this new particle, but at first you are not creating too much of it because, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, because the system doesn't have enough energy density to create too much of it. Energy density increases when I increase Hx. So if I have larger Hx, I have more particles to create of this heavier type. What's happening is that there is a trend decreasing, and now you add an increasing term, so which, which we just started to switch on. So there is a, yeah. So there could be, so, so, so there is some time until this grows up such that it can counteract the already existing decreasing trend, okay? That's a simple explanation. Let me postpone a little. That's actually due to the fact that the Lee Robinson velocity is decreasing. That's what, that's what I pointed out to you. So if you look carefully, we, 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 uh, I investigated how the energy density go, uh, goes with the parameter. Uh, then there are the masses of the particles to consider, so how much you can create of them by given energy, and you have to consider Libre Robinson velocity. So the energy density is increasing with the size of the quench. Mass goes up, so the particles are harder to create. This almost cancels these two effects, but then the Libre Robinson velocity uh, just slows down the thing, okay? So by basically, the, the, it, it is decreasing because the Libre Robinson velocity is decreasing as you increase Hx. The other effect is that there's a loosely bound new quasi-particle pair. At first, it's quite loosely bound because you are just over the threshold. But there is already a finite density post-quench environment, I mean, in which, in which it just becomes unstable by the presence of particles just kicking it. I mean, if, if the, bound, if the bound, uh, binding energy is not too big, then it just, it is just peeled apart by this hot soup. And the other thing is that the effective number of degrees of freedom, and, that's, and, and that's, that, 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 that's an interesting fact that I'm going to comment on, it actually varies with this distinguishability of particles. So this is what I already alluded to, that somehow the fact whether you have one or two types of particles is not as clear cut. You can have 1.2, 1.5, or 1.8 even, and it depends. It depends on how the peaks look like. So there's a, yeah. First, 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 there's light cone velocity. So this is just showing you the uh, uh, numerically determined uh, dispersion relation. You compute the you compute the Lee Robinson velocity from the maximum uh, steepness, and you see that it just it does decrease with h x increasing h x. So this is this is why it first starts decreasing, and only then the increase sets in. Okay, and so in the quasi-particle picture, if you if you see that there is a rate function which is this, uh, basically this entropy carried, but then there is also the velocity of the quasi-particles, and if this is decreasing and the rate function is not doing anything, anything very special, then all of it will go down. 
Right. And now, and now comes how you solve the Gibbs paradox actually for quasi-particles. It's a very nice paper by one of my old friends who, with whom I was at the same year at the university. So, who was considering this in QCD, you have this resonance gas hydro, uh, thermodynamics. Uh, so let me check. Yeah, good. So the, so the point is, uh, you see, is that in QCD, if you consider the low energy spectrum, there's a plethora of hadrons and mesons. I don't know, hundreds and thousands of them with different lifetimes. It's a huge number of degrees of freedom. While over the deconfinement confi transition, you just have a few quarks, few gluons. It's much less degrees of freedom. How could it be that the free energy varies continuously if the degrees of freedom jumps at the transition point? And the point is that the, you are not counting the degrees of freedom right. Because the, because the quasi-particles, as, as well in QCD as well in my case, they are of the same sort of excitations. They are made of the same, so to say, medium. They are, they are peaks. They are just quasi-particle peaks in, in some spectral density. And you suppose that there is some spectral density. This is a very simple thing. The spectral density of the, of, of the, uh, of, of the system is composed of just two Lorentz peaks. And then just using very standard thermodynamics, you can compute the effective number of degrees of freedom, for example, as, as determined from the entropy formula, whether it's a two or a one in front. And if you just use very standard uh, calculations of thermodynamics, quantum, so you, 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 do, you do the quantum computation with this spectral density of the system, it turns out that the effective number of degrees of freedom is two when they are distinguishable, when the, when the width you go with the width to zero, then these two peaks are very distinguishable, and the effective number of degrees of freedom goes to two. If you increase the widths, they start overlapping. In here, when they overlap, you actually don't, don't know which particle is which, so you cannot carry the which particle information. The which particle information goes down. So the mixing entropy should actually vary continuously with this overlap. And this is what happens. It actually even goes below one. <laughs> so you can have less than one particle at <laughs> the end, in a, in, a, in a certain sense. But when the width goes to zero, then you actually, the, the, so when the width goes to infinity and the peaks, are, peaks remain at the same, then you basically have just one peak. They join into one peak and you recover one. So that's, that, that's actually a very interesting little thing. It's, it's written down in this paper by Antal Jakovac, okay? So in our case, it's actually not the distinguishability of two quasi-particle peaks what matters because one of them is here, the other is there. So it, there is a finite distance between them and they are not that wide. But the point is that the second quasi-particle peak emerges from the first, first quasi-particle continuum of two particle states. And the question is whether it is distinguishable from them. Because if not, then it's not carrying any, any additional information compared to the pairs which are already there from the first quasi-particle. Okay, so that's basically the, the thing. I, I would like to quantify this. This is my intuitive picture. That, that would be very nice to quantify a little more, but there are, there are certain ingredients missing. For example, I don't know the spectral density of this spin chain to any uh, precision that, that I can calculate this, this there. Okay, there is the free state pot spin chain which I'm just going to flash. So probably everybody knows the free state pot, pot spin chain. As there are just free states. There's a ferromagnetic ordering term, transverse field which, which, tries, which tries to disorder the, uh, this, uh, right, like in the Ising model, and there is a magnetic polarization, right? And you have free states, and it's interesting that now the sign of the longitudinal field does matter because if it's positive, then it prefers one polarization, a single state. If it's negative, then it prefers two polarizations. In the Ising, that cannot happen. It either pref uh, prefers one or up or down, but up and down are the same. They are symmetric, so it doesn't really, it's, it's not really a difference. So the ferromagnetic phase is when the transverse field is less than one. Paramagnetic is transverse field is larger than one. And you do the quench, you get this. Same picture as before and you determine where the quasi-particle thresholds are. So again, you look at the spectrum. You find that there's a new quasi-particle appearing at these critical values of the longitudinal field. You look at where the minima are. You even see the small delay between the two. Delay is increasing with eight. Everything is, everything is fine. So it's, it's all the same pattern. So I think, I guess, yeah, I don't have now time for, for these things, but this is not, <laughs> this is not that central. So my interest wa here was uh, how the entanglement, how can we un understand the entanglement growth as after a quant quantum quench from the quantum particle description when you, normal, when, uh, you normally think that uh, 
that maybe the card calabrese picture is not fully valid, for example, because breaking integrability. And we, know, we knew that this quasi-particle picture was working for integrable post-point systems. We think it should work for low-density quenches, simply because the semi-classical, which I don't have time to describe, the semi-classical picture of, uh, of, of evolution, we expect it to be valid, so that, 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 is, that is exactly the same picture, basically. So what we found that for integrability breaking quenches, there are two interesting effects. One is the confinement effect, which suppresses light phone and uh, saturates the entropy growth too early. And the other is that if you have, if you, if you have a change in the quasi-particle spectrum, so that new quasi-particles appear, then they contribute to some anomalous increase in the growth rate of this, uh, of this entropy. So what I would like to do, the one is the confinement, it's, it's not listed here. The other thing is that I don't really have a theory behind this. And the complication is that uh, you have the two different particles. Actually, you have to be very careful. They have different Lee Robinson speeds. So, it's so, 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 so the standard, and if it's a mixed particle, it's not exactly clear to me how to calculate. And the, and, and the other point is that I don't have a theory for this, uh, for this rate functions. And also, when you are just, uh, when you are just uh, at the appearance of the new particle, then you expect that it's not an on-off effect. So you should somehow build in this, this idea by Jakovac about the about distinguishability, about the gradual onset of the, of the mixing entropy. And I, and I don't know how to do that either. So there are lots of unknowns, some vague ideas about what to do, but I think there's a the theory of how to describe this. I mean, qualitatively, I see that the quasi-particle picture must be working for this, because I, I, because I explained everything by the quasi-particle picture. I just don't know if I want to, if I want to fit in all the theoretical of all the details into an actual model calculation, how to assign each ingredient in that calculation of this entanglement growth. So this is what I would like to know. Some extensions, obviously, maybe some, and to see all this in experiments, that would be very nice. Okay? And that's all. Thank you. Uh,